If you came this way, taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity or carry report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. That was T.S. Eliot in Little Gidding, um, the last of the four quartets. Um, and Little Gidding is a, a very beautiful, tiny little church, very hard to find. Um, that was the final point in my recent exciting tour of Middle England, which um, Dominic has laughed at me about. But it, it <laughs> I'm was laughing now. It was uh, it was a kind of it, 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 a, a wonderful, wonderful place and a, a reminder that. Um, in a sense, uh, churches are among our most kind of intimate way to, to get in touch with history. Um, uh, Elliot, again, in, in, in Little Gidding, Elliot famously said that history is a pattern of timeless moments. And you kind of re can really feel that, I think, in churches. Or am I being overly romantic, Dominic? In no, I don't that? think you are at all. I think uh, certainly um, to bring out my inner John Bull, which is never much suppressed, I think England's wealth of of parish churches is the envy of any country in the world i mean these fantastic historical sites where as you say the sort of the 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 layers of the of the past just seem to kind of strip away as you walk inside the church and you 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 know you're standing where generations of people stood you're looking at what you know endless generations have, have looked at and a place that they took immensely seriously that kind of even now you don't have to be a believer to feel that these places are kind of weighed down with the solemnity and the seriousness of of the sort of yeah. faith of ages yeah and also i mean the, the coming of christianity and then the reformation and then i suppose the process of of, of de-christianization are such profound influences on on english british irish history that i think that um that that, that, that an episode devoted to what churches can tell us about the past is more than justified. And I just yeah. want to put it on record because there has been suggestion on Twitter that the fact that you've had COVID this past week and have been I, I have it as we speak. I have it as we speak. You I'm, have it I'm, as you I've speak. risen from my sickbed to do this. Wow. I mean, this is this is like a kind of yeah. something from the Bible in itself. It is. Um, but people have suggested that I have snuck this in while you've been. <laughs> yeah. While you've been. A, but actually, Dominic, this is your idea, isn't it? Yes, it pains me to admit it, but it is my idea. Um, because, Tom, I happen to know the absolute best person in the entire British Isles to... to um, you can't say British Isles. I you? just did. Um, and the Atlantic <laughs> Archipelago, I believe. The entire please. British Isles <laughs> to talk about churches. She's an Irish woman. Uh, her name is Rachel Morley. She's a former winner of Person of the Year at her old school. She's the director of the Friends of Friendless Churches and most of all her big claim to fame she is my sister-in-law and here she is hello rachel hello <laughs> morning rachel hi tom thanks for that dominic you're very welcome you were person of the year i was Don't be embarrassed about it no i'm not embarrassed <laughs> uh, i was person of the year but i find it very strange that you suggested this to uh, topic because anytime when i come to visit and i talk about churches or I bring them up, you always just kind of put your head in your hands and say, not a bloody, not another bloody church. There's a lot of rolling so, of eyes goes on in my house. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I'm surprised. Uh, I'm as surprised as anybody to be here today. So Rachel, Rachel actually wants to live with us, Tom. She lived with us for uh, 18 months. No, only about 10. Oh, and it felt you, like 18. Take, it felt like 18. <laughs> did you take Dominic around lots of churches? I hope so. I did not, no. Oh, missed opportunity. He wouldn't come. He wouldn't come with me. There's no point. What can you do with this man? I know, I know. No, no, but this is ridiculous because Dominic has suggested this subject. So, yeah. Dominic, I mean, this I is a great theme. This is a I great theme. So, let's. How are we going to do this? We get Rachel. You have um, chosen your. I mean, we said ten best. Best mm -hmm. is. A, I mean, it's a hopeless phrase. Ten I mean, top churches. I mean, and we put. So I put. I put a request for 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 kind of people's suggestions on on Twitter, and I don't think we've ever had. Um, quite the response that we had to that i mean we had more people reply to that than i think anything we've put out before an immense range of uh, of, of suggestions um dominic we had what did we have we had um uh, we had uh, some entirely predictable ones from yeah. uh, people who've appeared on the show so uh, dan jackson uh, author of uh, northumbrians um 
obviously went for a northern church they St. George's yes. they're all Northumbrian ones um, Jonathan Wilson um, son of Sunderland he went for St. Peter's Church Monk Wearmouth which is of course a brilliant choice um, that's the one um, that uh, f- famous for Bede um, yeah. the, the glory of the northeast uh, what else did we had? We had so, so Rachel. We had a lot of enthusiasm mm. for for Durham Cathedral. We had um, Simon Sharma. Yeah, he chose historian. Magnus Cathedral Kirkwall. Do you agree mm. with that choice, Rach? I do not. No. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um. Well, okay. okay, okay. The reason why is because you asked for churches, and so many people gave you cathedrals. I mean, that's uh, right. A rookie's that, error. Well, it's not what you asked for, so why would they be telling you cathedrals? Um, Simon Sharma didn't even read the question. He didn't even read the question, <laughs> exactly. So there we go. Um, and I guess the thing is, uh, I'm really nervous because this is a massive responsibility, okay? Um, and it's been done so many times before. Like, obviously, Betjeman did his best British churches. Right, um, yes. And on that, yes, yeah, so on that, just sorry, just to so we also have one from Giles Fraser. Mm hmm. Um, Famous vicar. Mm-hmm. Uh, famous vicar. <laughs> famous vicar. Top vicar. Um, and he suggested St. <laughs> Enadoc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, St. Enadoc uh, in North Cornwall, which is mm. a, a wonderful church, um, has a spire that looks like the tail of a stegosaur. Um, and it's, but also it's where John Betjeman is buried. And John, John Betjeman, Ra- he Rachel loved his been, churches, didn't he? Rachel has been to St. Enadoc Church with me. I have. Oh, so you have been to a church, Dominic? I, I have with yes, yeah. It's a great wow. church. It used to be it used Alleluia. to be covered. It used to be covered by sand dunes, didn't it, Rach? It did, yeah, exactly. And the vicar. And it's got a be... golf course all around it. It does, it does. yeah, it does, it does, yeah. The vicar yeah. used to have to climb down through a ladder, didn't he, in the roof? In the spire, yeah. In the spire, because it was just to... poking out through the sand, yeah. Yeah. So, Rachel, right. does that does that qualify St. Enadoc as as a, as a, one of the top churches? It's a great church. It's not on my list. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so so what are the qualifications you brought for your choice of the top ten? And we're including Ireland as well as Britain. Well, we'll see about (coughs) that. Um, Let's just say, okay, so Betjeman has done it. He did a thousand best churches. There's Alec Clifton Taylor. There's Pevsner. They're kind of like the giants of 20th century talking about And Simon Jenkins. Oh, yeah, and Simon Jenkins. But he sort of just ripped off Betjeman doing his thousand best (laughs) churches. Well, he did. Hard-hitting opinion on churches here. We've got them. And also, he didn't even go to all of the churches and... Some that are on my list are in, in his A Thousand Best Churches, which I think is just, you know, terrible that he... Uh, oh, yeah, that he, But also, I think there's a, there's a book that's the nation's favourite churches. But again, loads of people voted for cathedrals on that, which I just don't understand. I mean, there are like 16,000 churches in England alone. You have loads of choice. You don't have to go for the obvious <laughs> cathedrals. Anyway, and then there's Jay Hume on Twitter. And last year he did a... Um, he did a World Cup of major churches, which was hugely popular. Um, and the final two, I think, were uh, St. Saint Wolfram's in Grantham in Lincolnshire and Tewkesbury Abbey. And in the end, St. Wolfram's in um, Grantham, home of Isaac Newton and, well, not home, but he went to school there, and Margaret Thatcher, um, that one won. So that was very, that was very interesting. But basically, uh, thinking about it I was thinking okay so what do you go for for the best do you go for the oldest the biggest the you know the finest interior the one with the tallest spire the longest nave you know the smallest Ooh. you know if I mean if you're doing cathedrals you want to go for the tallest spire okay I, well, mean, I, I mean I think we can all agree that Salisbury is the best cathedral. it's not as good as but, Lincoln but, it's not as good as Lincoln Lincoln's yeah. a better cathedral My, than Salisbury. Yeah, well, no because mm. Lincoln's fell down Go on, Rach. Because it was don't so listen great. to Tom Holland. Anyway, that's fine. Right. Talk okay. over him. And then, okay, great, I will. And then there are other things like, you know, you've got churches that are called, like, you know, the Cathedral of the Marshes, the Queen of the Moors, all of these. And those are all kind of, like, great churches. But the thing is, whenever you do lists and compile things like this, it's always the same ones that come out. You always get the same ones. There's St. Peter's, Walpole St. Peter's in Norfolk. There's St. Mary's, Redcliffe in Bristol. Roslyn Chapel, Fairford, Long Melford, Burford, you know, so there's no point in me going through all of those because everybody knows those. And, you know, there are so many churches to choose from. There are 42,000 places of worship, around 42,000 places of worship in the UK. So, you know, let's kind of, let's look for actually ones that are a bit more interesting and not obvious choices. So that's Brilliant. mine. Okay. Is that's, that okay? That, that, yeah, that, that is a, that, that's fantastic specification. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> obvious, basically. Yeah, because it's... <laughs> So your top ten unobvious, yeah, churches, yeah, 
are, are you, have you are they in random order or are you going from 10 to 1 or well they're sort of in random order what i tried to do was try and make a nice story so that they all they all kind of oh, flow into good. one and the oh, other oh we like a story oh we do like a story great so yeah okay so what so, so what are you kicking off with okay i'm kicking off with uh one which is uh one that I one that I really like, obviously, because it's in my top ten. Um, but uh, that I used to live near Saint Mary the Virgin in Shrewsbury, and I absolutely love Shrewsbury. Dominic knows it's my favourite place in the whole of England, um, and Saint Mary Shrewsbury is a great church. Uh, you know, the river sort of carves out Shrewsbury, the river defines Shrewsbury and the, the, the town sort of rises up from there. And St. Mary's is kind of at the top of that. And it's a gorgeous old red sandstone church. It's got a great big spire. Um, that's all lovely. The reason why I'm bringing it in, first of all, is that it's got a really, um, uh, not just about the architecture, but it's got a really interesting story around it. Dominic, I don't know if you know this, you're a Shropshire native, aren't you? Uh, I don't know this. I am a Shropshire native. Grand. I, I blank out all church stuff because I leave that to you. Okay, thanks. So anyway, it's all about, uh, the story is all about Robert Cadman and he was an 18th century steeplejack and rope slider uh, and he used to perform all of these sorts of tricks and he was from Shrewsbury, which is lovely. And he travelled kind of all around the country, so he was in Dorset and Lincolnshire and newspapers kind of saying these great feats of daring that this guy used to do. Um, And he, one of his kind of big tricks was he would climb up the front of St Mary's which is, you know, a, a bits of a Norman church in there. So it's a really ancient church. So we'd climb up the front of it. It was 250 metres up the, the church, then a 68 metre spire up to the top. He'd have a rope going from the top of the spire down and anchored into a meadow across the other side of the river. So as he's going up, he's doing all kinds of sorts of, you know, tricks and making the crowd laugh and everyone's having a great jolly time. Anyway, he gets to the top and then he puts on a wooden breastplate and there's a big groove down the centre of it. And he hurls himself onto this rope and he's meant to slide all the way from the top of the spire over the river, over the meadows and kind of land, you know, perfectly standing on the other side in one piece, preferably. He did that several times. That was fine. Except uh, once, uh, which was kind of the end of it. The last time he did it, (laughs) which was 1739 when the rope, the rope actually snapped and, uh, and he fell and he died. So that's very sad. Um, Oh. <laughs> but there's a plaque on the outside of the church so right right by the main door as you go in so it's like a bit it's a big event in the church's history right so yeah. there's a plaque outside and it reads let this small monument record the name of cadman and to the future time proclaim how by an attempt to fly from this spire across the sabrina stream he did acquire his fatal end it was not for want of skill or courage to perform the task he fell but no no a faulty cord being drawn too tight hurried his soul on her high to take her flight, which bid the body here beneath good night. So that's lovely. So and he was basically a failed tightrope walker. No, but I mean, he had loads of success. Um, he, di- he died when he was 28, but he had loads of success up until then. <laughs> right, um, live fast, die young. But yeah, but, yeah, but, it's, but it's a really cool story. Anyway, um, but beyond um, that, the church is really interesting. So the but, actual building is great too. Go on, Tom. I was just going to say on the topic of of kind of jumping off the top of churches, um, you've given Dominic a Shrewsbury one, uh, a Shropshire one. Could, could I, th- there's a famous Wiltshire. Uh, oh, go on, yeah. Um, which is um, uh, Aylmer of Malmesbury, the monk who um, built himself a glider and hurled himself off the top of Malmesbury, and um, he, he crash landed and lost the, the use of his legs, but he didn't die. Oh. Okay. So, so I'm just sticking up for that. People who jump off churches in Wiltshire are slightly better at it than people who jump off it in Shropshire. So <laughs> I'd just rather be that killed. Out there. Well, he, well, you might, you might prefer to be killed outright. I think it depends how. No, because because then you have a long, profitable life as a hero of aeronautics. <laughs> well, a failed I mean, you, you hero know, of aeronautics, surely. No, he no, he, the, the glider worked. <laughs> anyway, listen, we're, we're getting off, and I'm just anyway, from anyway, anyway, to become anyway, top ten gliders rather than top ten churches. Dominic, um, I thought. I, I guess I kind of thought of you with this one. Obviously, there's a Shrop- Shropshire connection, but also you recently did a nice go ape challenge. So you were doing your own bit of rope sliding. I did. Would you? Would you, you? I mean, do you think you were as good as Cadman? Is I was terrified. Tell us about this. I don't know anything about this. Uh, we went in the summer. We went to. We went and did go ape with my son, two of his friends. Now the two friends um, uh, had difficulties completing the course, so that left me and Arthur. 
and I found it absolutely terrifying. So Go8 for people who don't know is this thing where you've got kind of platforms and and and, we, and, and walkways and kind of adventure playground type things suspended high in trees. Um, it's for sort of daredevil type activity. And I kind of does Dominic, it, does Dominic <laughs> strike you as a daredevil? <laughs> An intellectual loving, daredevil, surely. <laughs> I'm loving this insight into um, I actually how Dominic it, is seen. By I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I was so so terrified. There was a thing we had to do: a climbing wall suspended between two trees, um, uh, and it was a way of getting from tree to tree. So and, jumping off churches wouldn't be your bag. Um, I don't think it would. I did, there's a lot of zip wires involved in Go Ape. So, I mean, that's basically what was going on in Shrewsbury, isn't it? Sort of exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, great choice, okay. Rachel. Anyway, that's great choice. choice. But before, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Um, but anyway, just to say a couple more things about that church, because it is gorgeous. So it's, um, you know, it's like lots of lovely Norman bits, lovely old red sandstone. But when you go in, it's got an amazing 15th century roof, carved timber roof in the nave. But I think probably the real kind of crowning glory of the church is the stained glass. So it's got an almost complete Jesse window in the east window from about 1330. It did come from the old St. Chad's in Shrewsbury, which was um, which collapsed, uh, unfortunately. Um, but they've got that stained glass. But also in all of the other windows or most of the other windows, it's got some of the best collection of um, 16th and 15th and 16th century continental stained glass. I mean, it's amazing. You could spend hours looking at stained glass there. It's just gorgeous. But also, if you're in Shrewsbury, you can also go to St. Alkman's, St. Chad's, the Abbey. Uh, you can go to the Old Market Hall and Are you being lunch. paid by the, by the Shrewsbury <laughs> Tourist Board? I, I, would I would like to be, uh, yeah, I, I would like to work for Shropshire Tourism. And <laughs> Rachel, can I just ask you, just very quickly, it's, it, often when you go to churches, you'll be told, oh, the stained glass window got destroyed in the Reformation, or it got mm. destroyed, but shot by Cromwell's troopers or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. How true is that? Do you know? I mean, is, is it a... Uh, I imagine some of them were, yeah. But by and, lar <laughs> by and large, the idea that all stained glass window got smashed in the Reformation um, is... I mean, I, d I guess, uh, well, it I guess two things. It depended on what it depicted and how obvious it was, I suppose, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so I guess some of it was. I don't know. I don't think all of it was. I mean, de definitely no, all of it wasn't. No, obviously not. It's there. yeah, There's obviously some not. great survivals. Yeah. Presumably the more, the more figurative, but also the more obviously sort of papist it was. Yeah. The more likely it was to be destroyed. It must be as simple as that, surely. And just whether the church was occupied by, at some point by soldiers. Yeah. Like, like Burford, let's say. Yeah. Like soldiers were, billet were in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, oh. Rach, we're going far too slowly. I know. Okay, I'm going. And this is a big one. That was meant to be my short one, so we need to hurry up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, from there, uh, my my kind of seamless uh, segue into the next one is um, so that was uh, you know great feats of daring, you know brilliant people. So there, I go to North Wales to um, Saint Benol Clinog Fire in Gwynedd. Do you know this one, Tom? No. Okay, great. Dominic, I know you don't know, so there's no point asking you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I know you don't. I know you don't. Anyway, so um, St. Beno was probably one of the most important saints in Wales, um, definitely in North Wales. Uh, his name, me, it's kind of a mutation of Old Welsh, and it means knowing cattle. So Brilliant. even to the... Yeah. That's not a name you want. <laughs> <laughs> but also, well. to this day, he's still the patron saint of sick cattle and children. So there we go. <laughs> So anyway, from that you might think that Beno had a um, came from an agricultural background, but he didn't actually. Uh, he was a grandson of a king of Powys in the seventh century, um, and ultimately he chose the monastery over the monarchy. Uh, he packed off to Bangor and he became an ab abbot. He was a missionary. He travelled around a lot. That's all great. There's eleven churches in total dedicated to him. One is the smallest, one of the smallest, St. Col Saint Beno's Colbone in Somerset, which is very nice. Um, but the one I want to talk about is St. Beno's Clinog Fair, and that's on the Clin Peninsula, uh, and it is a 15th century whopper. Like, it's just, it's gorgeous, it's huge, it's massive, big massive space. It's got this gorgeous, it's plain glazing, no stained glass in the east window, um, but it's got, you know, uh, screen misery cord it's got uh lovely crocketed um sorry dominic you won't like me using technical terms i know i was warned off using terms that people would people wouldn't know but anyway crocketed sedilia all of that sort of stuff it's great um but this church was the site of this uh the monastery saint Beno's monastery 
So it's really interesting. Beno was buried here. He was interred in the monastery chapel. Um, but the monastery and the chapel were both destroyed by uh, Vikings in the 10th century. And Coming then, from Ireland, presumably. Were they? Why would Vikings be attacking North Wales? Were they coming from Dublin or something? Maybe, yeah. Um, you don't care. I don't. I don't really care because that's not uh, that's not on my story, and I have no time to talk about all this. Anyway, so there's loads to say. So anyway, what's interesting is across the road there's a holy well, um, with Saint Bano's holy well, and apparently if you went on your pilgrimage, you could go to this holy well, uh, you could be dunked into the water, and you would be cured of anything from epilepsy rickets and impotence but to make it work you had to go for a big dunking in the well then go across the road to the church and sleep on top of Bano's grave um, for the night so that was great um, and then that was all fine and that was actually a practice that continued like until the 17 until the 1700s but nobody does it now nobody does it now because rather than the Vikings the Victorians came along and said that the tomb was unsafe so they dismantled it uh, oh, health and safety uh, for health and safety yeah Victorian oh, health and safety for sake but um, so Cadman's great gift sort of was sliding down ropes Baino's ga- great gift is um, bringing people back from the dead so he did this lots of times that was great and it included his niece Winifred um, she chose to be a nun her jilted lover chopped off her head which seems to be a occupational hazard if you were a saint in Wales kind of back in the 7th 8th century 6th 7th century but St. Winifred's well in Flintshire is on the site where her head fell off and apparently the spring came up and mm-hmm. it's actually um, uh, it's one of the most popular places in Wales it's absolutely gorgeous uh, it's called the Lords of Wales so that's great so d- do Lords people still go Wales. there to get to get healed? yeah, yeah. brilliant yeah. how many? So uh, lots of people? loads of people loads of people loads of people yeah Anyway, just very, very quickly, because there's loads of, sto- there's loads of great stories about Beno, but actually my favourite one is basically, he was really popular, everyone wanted, a, everyone wanted a bit of him, you know, in his monastery and all this sort. So he needed a bit of time to pray, so he'd, what he used to do was he'd go out into the middle of a river, and he had a rock, and he'd kneel on the river to pray at night time. Anyway, one night he was disturbed, and he, was, he muttered something under his breath, and obviously he's got a direct line to God, so he said something like, you know, somebody should teach that person a lesson or something like that, something to those effect. <laughs> and basically all of these wild animals came out of the woods and ripped this person to shreds. And anyway, Beno, Beno just continued praying, didn't notice, came back, and then he realised it was one of his pupils, a guy called Al Hearn. Um, and he was, you know, Beno was in an awful way but luckily he has this power of bringing people back from the dead so basically he just went around and gathered all the bits of him and put him back together and he was fine but he couldn't find his eyebrow Beno couldn't find one of his eyebrows <laughs> he was missing so what he did was he thought he looked around and he said oh okay so he had his staff that he used to help get him out of the river and they had an iron tip so he took the iron tip off his staff stuck it onto Al Heron's forehead and gave him his other eyebrow. And from then on, this, sa- this Saint Al Heron, he became a saint, was known as Iron Eyebrow. Brilliant. So he's not wow. the patron saint of plastic surgeons. <laughs> 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 no, just sick cattle. So, right. yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's a, great, that's, a, that's a great one as well. That's a very good one. Okay. I like and I mean, the whole thing, people worrying about, you know, people not, churches are worried that people aren't going to church. I mean, the option of being brought back to life I mean, that would be. I know. But, that, but, but I mean, surely the option of being brought back to life is a key part of the Christian <laughs> yeah, faith, isn't exactly. it? Some... <laughs> oh, Dominic, <laughs> stopping it with your theological jokes. <laughs> okay, so Go that's right. brilliant. So that's two. All so, right. So Ooh, number gosh, three. Okay. okay, three. Big one. We're staying in North Wales. This time we're going to St. Brothin's, Hlanfrothin in North Wales. This is one. Bro- say that again. Sorry. sorry. St. <laughs> Brothin, Hlanfrothin. Okay. All right. That's fine. Just checking. That's fine. Did you, did you think you might know it, Dominic? If I, if I, I did, repeated yeah, it. I did. Yeah. I did, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. Um, hey, that one. <laughs> so this is this is a great church. This is one that I actually look after with Friend of the Friendless Churches. But um, this is a church where um, uh, there's one man and he basically changed the course of history after his death at this church. So do either of you know a guy called Robert Roberts? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Right, okay. I didn't think you did. He was a North Walian qu- quarry man in 1888. <laughs> but, you know, but oh, him. Histo- you're him. Histori- that one. <laughs> you're course. historians, come on. So anyway, D- Robert Roberts died 1888 and he wanted to be buried next to his daughter. That was his one wish. Uh, 
But his daughter, but he wasn't a member of the established Church of England. Dun, dun, dun. He was a nonconformist. Uh, and that's where all the trouble began. There's loads of kind of story about why this didn't work out for him. But basically, um, the vicar wouldn't allow him to be buried in the church next to his daughter, in the churchyard next to his daughter. And the scene was sort of set for a clash. Um, so how it all happens was uh, kind of uh, Robert Robert's family went to a newly qualified solicitor. A guy you will know, definitely. You'll know this guy if you don't know Robert Roberts. Um, David Lloyd George, have you heard of him? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Do Dominic's like hero. <laughs> Dominic loves David Yeah, Lloyd okay. Sorry, it's, it sounds like I've sort of picked <laughs> Dominic's best churches. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's right. That's how it should be. Uh, that was unintentional, but I thought I'd, I'd get this in. So basically, this, um, this burial um, is sort of what um, launched David Lloyd George's career. So basically, he was a newly qualified solicitor. He was aged 25 and he took up this case and he advised the family to just go ahead, defy the vicar, defy, defy the diocese and bury Robert Roberts next to his daughter in the church, I mean, Church of Wales um, churchyard. But the vicar knew this was kind of brewing. So he locked up the churchyard and all of this uh, and so they couldn't get in. But what they did do, led by David Lloyd George... They went to this really remote church down all of these winding lanes. They brought the body down there. David Lloyd George broke open the churchyard gates and by candlelight and lanterns, they buried Robert Roberts next to his daughter. All lovely, until the vicar found out. Then there was a huge court case. The jury voted in favour of the Roberts family. The judge um, voted in favour of the church. Not voted, you know what I mean. Um, uh, David Lloyd George appealed it at the high court and eventually won. But that basically launched his career because then two years later, he was voted the MP um, for Carnarvon Shear and then he became, you know, the rest is history, as you oh, might say. Oh, goodness. Nicely done, very nicely done. Ha- has anyone ever done that before? <laughs> they haven't, actually. Actually, oh. no, you're the first. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do, can I just ask, the, the, the daughter, how long had she been dead? Do we know? Uh, oh, golly. Was it a kind I, of mouldering body or...? It was a mouldering body, yeah. Definitely, Ooh. definitely, yeah. yeah. So this is basically a battle between dissenters, Welsh dissenters, yeah. and the established church, which and the was a, church. Yeah. a huge political issue, actually, in the late it was, 19th, it was. early 20th century. Well, I exactly. mean, completely forgotten now. Well, exactly, but also all of this stuff... So, you know, David Lloyd George did... I mean, Lloyd George, I can probably just call him that. I don't need to give him his full name. Um, uh, but this case became sort of the catalyst for the establishment of the the church um in wales as well which um yes. you know in in which eventually happened in the 1920s so all of that sort of happened because because of this burial case which is really cool but just really quickly um the church is amazing too so saint brothin was a like sixth century saint it's the church is thir- now 13th century it's built on an uh, right on the estuary um, so right on the shore, it's amazing 15th century roof, massive timbers, absolutely gorgeous. Definitely go and see it. Okay, well, so a landmark right. in the history of disestablishmentarianism. Yeah, exactly. Well done, Tom. <laughs> Just definitely a word we've never had on the podcast yeah. before. Um, and before we move from that area, yeah, I just have the fourth one. You got the fourth. No, no, no. This is just kind of a little, you know. A cheat. This okay. is this is this is 3A. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you really like your uh, prime ministers, which you know I know some of the listeners to this show should or sh- um, do, you should go and see Saint Daniel's in Hawarden in Finchier, which is where Gladstone was married in 1839. Do you know this, Dominic? You're nodding. Uh, yeah, Gladstone Hawarden. Yeah, of course. Fine, grand. Um, but apparently, when they got married, the church was crammed to suffocation with females, which you know some people might like. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, what's really interesting about this? There's obviously that history, but there's a memorial chapel to Gladstone, and the family commissioned Gladstone's very good friend Burne Jones to design the window. And it's an absolute—I mean, Burne Jones is great uh, if you like him. <laughs> some people don't. <laughs> Um, but it's an amazing window it's a nativity scene you know it's massive all beautiful kind of usual Burne Jones style but yeah definitely worth going to see if you like Prime Ministers and Burne Jones wow we do yeah we love it yeah on this podcast we love Burne Jones we love Prime Ministers so that's absolutely ticking every box and Rachel we've 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 been talking for half an hour so I think we should have a break and really? You've done, you've done three I know so you've got to get seven in so the, there's now huge jeopardy yeah will you be able to get your now seven into half an hour. I mean, um, guys, 
yeah. don't go away. Yeah. I'm not allowed to say that, am I, Dominic? Because it sounds appealing. But, but I mean, this is so exciting. Well, no one would want to go away because it is so exciting. Can you get seven into half Can you get seven half into half, half an hour? Definitely Come back not. Come in a minute. Find <laughs> out. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We are facing uh, half an hour of intense excitement and jeopardy as our guest, <laughs> Rachel Morley, the, the director of Friends of Friends Churches, former winner of Person of the Year, is going to see if she can fit her remaining seven <coughs> churches into the l- l- last <laughs> half hour of the show, having taken the first half hour to do three churches. So, Rachel, It's massive, isn't it? It's high-octane church. I mean, this is unbelievable drama. At its best. <laughs> Okay, so neither of you talk for the next half an hour, please. Okay, okay so and I'll just yeah. get it out. Fine. Okay, next number four on my list. Uh, oh, I have I have a big intro to this because I want to try and fit as many churches in as possible. So I'm just going to try my best. Okay, right. Anyway, Whew. who knows about the Commonwealth Grace Commission? Yeah, I do. I've been to it. Actually. Well done. Anyway, okay. Yeah. There's a book, there's a really good book that came out, I think last year or the year before, called Tomb with a View by Peter Ross. He's got a great chapter in it. Uh, and he taught me lots about the Commonwealth Grave Commission that I didn't realise. So things like, uh, if you're buried in a Commonwealth Grave c- Cemetery, your, your stone has to be 813 millimetres above the grass. Um, and your the grass has to be cut between 3.5 and 6 centimetres. I thought that was very interesting. Anyway, this is kind of a segue into... <laughs> Number four, which is uh, World World War Churches Chapels, Memorial Churches Chapels. So I want to call out just two, which will be very familiar, and I'm not going to have time to talk about them in any great depth, despite I've written loads. There's the Italian chapel in Orkney, which is great. It's a, a prisoner of war, um, double Nissen huts. They used cement. They used things like corned beef tins to make candle holders um, uh, and uh, car exhaust to make the font. Really great. Rach, let me interrupt. Yes. One of our listeners suggested yeah. this. Kimbru, Kimbru Fod. Kimbru Fod. He suggested it. Well, so, well, Kimbru, uh, give yourself a massive round of applause. Yes. Great. He's anyway, moving on from that, um, there's a Wales place of work. There's a Wales prisoner of war uh, chapel, which many people don't know about. It's um, Hentlen Chapel near the, near the River Tyvey. Uh, that was a 1994 chapel again. Um, sorry, 1994, 1944 <laughs> chapel. It's again. It's a Nissan hut. Um, and they used all sorts of things like berries, tea, coffee. They burned fish or boiled fish bones to make glue and they decorated. That's all great. I have to go at really high speed. So, number four. Neither um, of those was number four. No, no, unbelievably. no. Those, those, were, those were just ones that deserve a mention. They're, they're, they deserve a mention, but they're not number four. So, number four is probably one of the most moving places I've ever been in my whole entire life. Um, it's the Sandon Memorial Chapel in Hampshire. Uh, it is outside it's a really modest kind of red brick chapel um, but inside it is just uh, I mean it's it's just this epic large scale murals the interior is entirely painted um, by Stanley Spencer and it was done between 1920 and 1926 um, and it was built to honour the forgotten dead of, of World War I specifically Lieutenant Harry Sandham who basically uh, he was on the Salonica front with um, with Spencer he came back from the war but he uh, he died from he caught malaria they think while he was out there and he died once he came back but he doesn't appear on any official kind of list or anything because he wasn't kind of you know one of the um, the uh, official war offic- official official war dead exactly great thanks Dominic anyway what's great about this is so it's scenes from so Stanley Spencer he worked as an orderly in Beaufort Hospital in Bristol and then he was out on the Salonica front and basically there are a series of paintings so it shows his um his time in the hospital uh, working in the hospital so it's like filling tea urns changing the beds doing the laundry um all of that sort of thing uh, and then above you've got um scenes from um for scenes from Salonica and it's I mean it's so it's so moving he painted himself into it so he's you know he's cooking rashers there's a dog licking out an empty Frey Bentos tin um there's I mean it but it's it's so it's 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 just so powerful because of the scale that they're on and then I have to miss out so much because I've no time but anyway the east wall is this resurrection scene and it's not like any other resurrection scene you will ever see it's basically um uh the it, it, 
in the center there's a carriage and the it's broken apart it's split apart there's bits of wood flying everywhere there are two horses which have collapsed right in the middle and it's just a chaotic scene right in the foreground and it's all of these men who are getting out of their graves and they're picking up their white crosses and they're walking towards a figure barely decipherable in the kind of background and it's a little white figure of Christ he's tiny and they're walking up and they're giving their crosses to Christ and after that they walk past him and um, into kind of a, a peaceful landscape which is Watership Down which is near near where the chapel is located Watership as Down as in, as in the rabbits as in rabbits yeah but also it's a place it's a real place so anyway so that's absolutely amazing but what was really terrible about this was when they came to consecrate the chapel all the various bishops said they wouldn't they wouldn't consecrate it because it showed animals being resurrected so the horses were kind of you know coming back to life and the dogs and stuff like that and they said animals don't have souls so we're not going to resurrect it eventually the bishop of Guildford said he would consecrate the chapel but only if they put curtains and stuff over the animals because they um, my god that's very harsh isn't it bonkers Anyway, that is, that is one of the most... I haven't done it justice. Animals, it animals definitely have souls. And, and Rachel, did, is it, Spencer did this before Cookham and all that. Yes, yes. So Cookham is, um, you know, what he called, like, a little suburb of heaven. So, yeah, so that's his... There's all that kind of amazing stuff, again, all of that, coming yeah. out of the graves and things. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No, it's just, it's one of the... Um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those... And, sorry, I will just say, there's one scene in it where... It's in the hospital and they're meant to be disinfecting the bedside lockers. So it's it's uh, they've got these copper baths and there's a man kind of, you know, putting them into the thing. But Stanley Spencer was really small. He was like five foot two and weighed less than seven stone. And he couldn't actually physically lift the um, lockers into the bath to do the work. And he paints himself into it and he's crouching, he's hiding between the two baths and um, trying to kind of get away from it all. Um, and it's just, oh, sorry, I have... No, it sounds. I'm thinking about it. It's one of. It's just. Yeah, people. More people should know about it. It's so wonderful. Well, thank you. That's that very sounds good. Amazing. All right, number five. Okay, this is a very quick one. This was meant to be my number five and my breaking point because I wanted to sing a little song at the end of it. <laughs> oh my god! Do that. I can't miss out on the song. Do that. All you right. Still okay. Sing song. Just very very quickly. So number five is Saint Nicholas's Worth in Sussex. So this is a. Um, it was once in a clearing of a forest. It's the largest Saxon cruciform church that still um, survives on its original foundations. The forest is now cleared and the church is sort of squeezed between the M23 and uh, a, a, a housing estate in Crawley. Um, but it is one of, like, I know Dominic, you're making faces, but it is actually like one of, it's one of the most important and uh, ancient churches. Somebody once described it as the most beautiful set of arches left to us by the Saxon world, which is great. Sounds good. Yeah, anyway. Uh, interesting things about this is all the Saxon stuff obviously but in the churchyard you will find Robert Whitehead who does anybody know who he was? No Tom Fine He was the inventor of the torpedo Oh Oh, that's a good fact It is a good fact and basically he sold his first torpedoes to the Austrians and then in 1912 his granddaughter went to um, uh, like I don't know, and not launch torpedoes, that'd be terrible, to celebrate a, like a new torpedo or something in Austria. <laughs> and she met, As you do. she met the commander who was George von Trapp and she went on to marry him. They had seven ah. children in 12 years. Then she died and the husband uh, got a, moved to Salzburg, hired and needed a nun a nun, called, and needed a nanny. Who needed a nanny, got a nun called Maria and then they became the von Trapp family choir and they, there's the sound of music. That is a very, very okay. good story. That is it a, is a good story. But, and I can see why you need a song. Well, no, I'm not going to sing The Sound of Music, but basically it, there's so much Saxon stuff about this. So it's Saxon arches, Saxon foundation, Saxon apps, Saxon windows. I don't know if this is right, but I I like to make up songs. Dominic will know this is sort, sort of a thing in our family. Uh, we like to make up random songs about things. So I I'm would, always making up songs, Tom. So if I, if I could give St. Nicholas Worth a song, I would call it. Sorry, I feel so embarrassed now, but anyway. I'm too Saxon for my shirt. Too Saxon for my shirt. So Saxon, it hurts. Anyway, there we go. We've, 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 never, we've never had, had that singing on the podcast about right? the Anglo Saxons before. But I think we should make it a rule. <laughs> anyway, there we go. We have to. We have to move on. Sorry, guys. Is that, is that the only song? That's the only song. 
Oh, sorry. How disappointing. Oh. Sorry, sorry. I mean, who knows? I might come up, come up against anything else. Spontaneously. Anyway, um, the next one is Time and Space Church. Dominic, I know you like this. Um, sorry, Tom, you might like this too. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of leaving you out. Sorry. Anyway. No, no, I... I uh, you you focus on Dominic. He needs okay. ed- he needs right. education. He does need yeah. education. Yes. Anyway, so Dominic, I know you did a series on, or a program on sci-fi, didn't you? A series, Rach. A series. A whole series. Oh, I thought it was just one off. Oh well, there we go. It's a great <laughs> great series. If anybody would like to uh, watch it. Uh, yeah, tomorrow's world. <laughs> tomorrow's world. The, the unearthly history of science Sandra. fiction. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, I don't know if you mentioned this because I don't actually remember if I watched the program. So, oh. um, <laughs> but. First of all, I want to go to uh, St. John the Baptist Whitbourne in Herefordshire. Weirdly, we didn't mention that in our science fiction series. Well, Dominic, that is a huge oversight on your part because at the end of the 17th century, that is when Francis Goodwin, the Bishop of Herefordshire, he was living next to the church and he wrote the world's first science fiction novel, The Man on the Moon. The Man, in, the man in the Moon. You didn't get know the, that? Get the title right. <laughs> the Man in the Moon. The Man in the Moon. Anyway, basically, very quickly, it's a Spanish man called Domingo Gonzalez. He's stranded on an island and he trains a flock of swans to um, uh, to basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To basically fly him away in a cart and they fly him up to the moon. And when he gets to the moon, or when he's on his way to the moon, he realises that actually Copernicus was right, that the, uh, the Earth is not the centre of the universe and it revolves around the sun. And when did he write this? At the end of the 17th century. Right. Very, very end of the 17th century. And he also describes gravi- gravity, which is decades before Isaac Newton would ever go on to discover it. Godwin's buried in the churchyard in Whitburn. That's not the church. This is, again, just a second. Oh, way. God. That's not even the church. <laughs> it's not the church. It's not the church. Anyway. There's so little time. No, no, you, no, no. You no, keep no. doing these segues. So little time, but so many churches. Anyway. Then, uh, so we talked about Isaac Newton. From there, we go to St. Peter's and Paul Market Overton in Rutland. Uh, basically, Isaac Newton's mother was from there. He spent a lot of time there. Um, the church at Market Overton has lots of lovely Saxon elements. And in the churchyard, they discovered a bronze um, Saxon water clock, something that was kind of developed or derived from the ancient Egyptians. Newton was fascinated by this, and it kind of spurred on his uh, studies and experiments into time and space. And apparently, there's a sundial on the church and he donated it to the church in kind of gratitude for it kind of spurring on his studies anyway the church that i want to talk about which is actually number six is um neither of those were the church no 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 unbelievable no 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 anyway but there's so many good churches but basically it's saint gregory's kirkdale in yorkshire i think somebody somebody definitely mentioned this on your list i'm pretty certain um so uh above that church you will find a preserved saxon sundial Oh yes, uh, yes, you know that's one? wonderful. That is a good one. Great. I'm glad you know it. <laughs> yes, and it's it's um it's next to where William Buckland found the uh, hyena. That's correct. Bones oh, in the Tom, cave. Tom, yes, you're ruining my ending. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, fine. Rachel. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. It's no, fine. but I love that church. Okay, that's good. But you know that there's a, like a uh, it's got like the longest inscription in Saxon English on that sundial. Do you know it? Do you know what it says? Uh, I can't remember, but I do remember knowing He that. doesn't remember. Okay, great. So I'll read it out to you very quickly. So it says, Orm, the son of Gamel, bought St. Gregory's Church when it was utterly broke and fallen and caused to be made anew from the ground. He dedicated to Christ and St. Gregory in the days of King Edward and the days of Earl Trusty. Haworth bought me and... Harith wrought me and brand the prior. So... From that, you can date the sundial to about 1055, 1065-ish, when Edward the Confessor was king, right? That's all great. Tosti is better known as Tostig, the brother the of, of Harold. Yeah, the name cat of my cat. The name of my cat. Tostig. Do you? Oh, great. Yeah. Lovely. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it all connects. It all connects. It all connects. But basically, then Tosti um, was killed. Uh, he killed the Gamal in that inscription, and then eventually he was himself killed at uh, Stamford Bridge. Stamford Bridge, yeah. yeah, basically. But the, the <clears throat> sundial is great. It's um, it was covered. It remains in such good condition because it was um, plastered over for about seven hundred years and was only discovered in seventeen seventy one. But remarkably, it's actually 
the sundial is a reused grave slab. So when the when Orm, son of Gamel, says in this inscription that he the, the old church was broken down, they reused bits of that much earlier church, which 20th century excavations found to be um, about 8th or 9th century, which is really cool. So they found like carvings and stuff like that in the walls. Um, and yeah, there's loads of lovely cross slabs and all of that sort of stuff in the in the walls, which is great. Anyway, that's right about Buckland. Quarry Man, 1821, I think, yes, um, found uh, nearby from there, uh, reopened a cave, Stone Age things, hyena bones, but also um, hippopotamus bones. And yeah. it is, yeah, okay, Tom, you know what? Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's and, it's and it's such a kind of dramatic setting. Yeah, absolutely. Go down from the church, down into, yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's crack on. What okay. are you on now, number eight? No, number, number seven. seven, number seven. Oh, my God. This is a quick one. Okay, this Six. is... This is this is uh, this is weird animals to weird animals, sort of. Um, so hippopotamuses to turkeys. Great. Okay. So um, most people think of churches and think of Christmas. That's definitely what the Church of England um, stats will tell us, anyway. But also, there's a Yorkshire church that celebrates not only the coming of Christ but also the coming of the turkey. Does anybody know what Saint Andrew's Boynton in Yorkshire? No, I don't know. Fine. Okay. It's a gorgeous church, but there are turkeys everywhere in the church. And the reason is because William Strickland of Boynton, he bought the first turkey to Britain. So in 1526, he went to America to find his fortune. He went looking for gold, but came back with six turkeys. (laughs) Basically, uh, he bred them and then he sold them. And they became so popular, he became really rich. He was able to build a country house. He became an MP in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Um... But he adopted the turkey as his kind of family symbol. So there's a turkey lectern, there's turkeys in the window, there's turkeys all over the tombs. It's great. Um, So first turkey came from him. And also when he was trying to get his coat of arms, um, he used the turkey. And his little sketch of a turkey is the earliest depiction of a turkey in the whole of Europe. That's fantastic. So a claim to fame. And and why why shouldn't turkeys be in churches? Why shouldn't they be in churches? They're God's creatures. That's... Right, yeah. Uh, uh, But also, as well as the turkeys, the church is absolutely gorgeous. Inside, it's like a Georgian box. Beautiful. uh, Redesigned by John Carr of York in the 18th century. Green panelled pews. It's got um, clustered columns, cornice, plaster putties, swags, medallions. It's got this flourish of a staircase. Um, Absolutely gorgeous. And my favourite is a really lovely Norman tub font where it's got intersecting arches, kind of little, almost kind of classical capitals and plinths um, on the arches. And it's kind of got this greenish tinge and it's absolutely lovely. Loads more to say about that, but we have no time. Okay. Okay. Great. So we've got two left. Three left. No, we have three left. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm going to be really quick. I'll try. No, we've got 10 minutes. Oh, okay. The next one is a long one. Okay. So, (laughs) so this, (laughs) This is kind of all this about like... This is so exciting for the listeners, <laughs> finding out whether you're going to do it or not. Okay. Let me just look at the time. Fine. 15 minutes. Okay, fine. 10. 10. All oh, right, Tom, I get it. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next thing is all about like superstitions and magic in churches. So first of all, I want to just give a mention to... This is not the church, by the way. I want to give a mention to St. Cadfans in Gwyneth, which is... It's got a crying night. It's a 13th... Uh, 1350s effigy and basically apparently the knight has been crying for about 650 years but but uh, there's like water dripping out of his right eye all the time this is my right eye um uh but somebody did some research and actually it's a fault in the stone <laughs> this oh, well there's there's, there's uh, the very similar thing at bartholomew the great oh right London, okay yeah where there was there was somebody who was crying and then yeah. they fixed the drains and it stopped <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's it's pretty much that sort of thing, which is sad. Um, from there, a really popular church was St. Issue Patricio in Powys, where there's a kind of a, a rusty painted skeleton on the west wall. People, he's um, holding up a shovel and a hourglass, um, and people have tried and tried and tried to whitewash him out, but he keeps seeping back to the surface, so he can't get rid of him. That's lovely. Then, um, kind of staying around that area, there's St. Michael's and Cascob. And there's an inscription on the wall, which I think is really, which I think is brilliant, where a kind of, that kind of superstition and faith kind of, you know, kind of the mixture is really good. So it's a, um, about 1700, and the inscription reads, O Lord Jesus, we beseech thee for thy mercy that this holy charm, 
abracadabra. <laughs> Make sure thy servant. Elizabeth. Does it really say abracadabra? It says abracadabra. Yep. Make sure thy ser- <laughs> servant Elizabeth Lloyd from all evil sprites and from all their diseases. Amen. So that's good. Nice. So yeah, uh, and then uh, just very quickly to say that uh, one such evil sprite could be Lilius Addy, who is um, in Scotland. So she was a, uh, a witch who died in prison uh, in Scotland in 1704. She's buried on the shore of Torrey Bay in Fife. Um, and she's they put like a massive sandstone slab over her grave so that she couldn't get out, basically. Uh, and she was a witch because she confessed probably under great torture to having sex with the devil. So that was unfortunate. Um, but basically her body was dug up in the 19th century. Uh, her skeleton was made, it was sold off, made into walking sticks, all of those sorts of stuff. What? You know? <laughs> what? I'd, I'd happily have such a walking it's stick. It's awful, it's awful. And now, it's a I think, terrible thing. I know, and people, um, there's, a, there's a group in Scotland that are trying to kind of get her... Bring all the walking sticks back together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and bury her properly. Anyway, but... Just get on them. Well... Uh, uh, kind of so that lady you know admitted to having sex with the devil that's fine but in Shropshire there's Halston Hall where there's a guy called Mad Jack Mighton I don't know if anybody knows of him no okay Is, great yeah I know him I okay know him. great yeah. so you know this fella drank six bottles of port a day he fed his dog steak and champagne he went duck shooting naked on a frozen lake he dressed up as a highway man and ambushed his guests he rode a bear into dinner um, when you know as a kind of a spectacle but he was absolutely fine, so there was nothing kind of untoward about his behaviour, and he's buried in the crypt. So you know, they, they, they didn't have to bury him under a um, uh, under a big massive sandstone slab. But anyway, the church. It's everyday I, sexism, isn't it? Uh, it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, but hold on, she she'd been having sex with the devil. She had me riding a bear. They're two very different. Things. No, but she didn't actually have sex with the devil, Dominic. She was probably tortured. She died in prison probably because they tortured her. I just think I, we should take a bit of a open-minded approach to these okay okay fine anyway number eight is Ain Hallow on Scotland and so hold on no no that wasn't even number eight no 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 but these were just kind of this is the preamble I I like a preamble okay very very quickly Uh, Ain Hallow was is an island um, in Orkney um, and it was once in the grip of a magic <coughs> spell and it was completely inaccessible to humans. So uh, the so- stories go that it was occupied by the Finn folk who are kind of, you know, sorcerers, sort of dementory type people. Um, uh, and uh, they used to abde- abduct children and all that sort of stuff. But basically, uh, humans eventually did make it over there. And by the salt and the sign of the cross, they retrieved the island from the Finn folk and they built a little church there. And for a long time, it was thought that the soil of this um, Ain Hallow was so sacred um, that it would repel anything that was undesirable. So even rats and mice. So people used to like to go and get a handful of soil to kind of keep all the undesirables from their house. Anyway, really quickly, because I don't have very much time. um, This is... uh, this is a really kind of ancient old Norse church on Orkney. It's just a ruin now. It was... um, it was kind of redis- it was it, it, the church was repurposed into a dwelling in and around the 16th century nobody knew it was there until it was discovered by chance in 1851 um but it is hugely important massively under researched um and yeah you, you can see bits of the Norse kirk the, you know the porch the gables the nave the naves the chancel walls there it's kind of all sorts and, of there and is it under research because it's so difficult to maybe can live there is it under research because nobody you can go out there one day a year um, one day be, a year yeah so no wonder it's difficult to research <laughs> exactly anyway very quickly because we have no time moving on so what I love about churches is all the stuff in them is this number nine now this is number nine yeah very quick um, number nine okay Whew. big shout out to <laughs> big shout out to St Bothell's Harden in West Sussex <laughs> it's, it's well, this is the preamble again this is the preamble okay Big shout out to St. Bothell's Hardham in West Sussex, which has some of the oldest wall paintings in the UK. Um, it's got the Annunciation, the Massacre, um, Adam and Eve, George and the Infidels, Doom, Flight into Egypt, all there, amazing, date to about 11, the 1100s, 11 uh, on the side of a road, cars flying past, nobody knows, knows it's there, great. And it survived because it was whitewashed? Or yes, was it just so obscure correct, that... Correct, Yeah, yeah. Okay. St. Lawrence, Broughton and Buckinghamshire, brilliant church, on the outskirts of Milton Keynes. <laughs> um, it's really great wall paintings, nothing on the outside, inside, 
15th century wall paintings, massive George and the Dragon, you've got dooms, you've got, you know, blacksmiths, you've got all this sort of stuff. What I love is it's got a, a little panel called the Warning to the Blasphemers. And you've got all these kind of, you know, contemporary um, dressed 15th century fellows and looking all nice and dandy. And in the middle is a pieta and Christ is kind of lying there and his body is kind of being pulled apart. So it's like the, sh the skin is shredded off his arms and legs and there's blood dripping around and these guys um are like you know they're drinking and they're playing you know i don't know backgammon or something and they're swearing on christ's body and basically and and some of them hold up bits of bones and heart and stuff like that and it's um that every time you swear on christ's body or you blaspheme uh, you're prolonging christ's suffering there we go anyway the real star, number nine, doo -doo -doo, is St. Caddock's Clancarfin in Vale of Glamorgan. So these oh, what? So not no, St. No, no. Thomas's, not St. Thomas's in Salisbury. No, it's not. This is a better oh. one, Tom. Sorry, much better actually, because the Salisbury one is lovely, but actually it's been really over restored. Sorry about that. Please don't kill me oh, well. or hate me. Anyway, no, 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 this no, is a great no, church, a little whitewashed church in the Vale of Glamorgan. Uh, the wall paintings were only discovered in two thousand and eight. And they are some of, I mean, they're some of the best in the whole of Europe. Unbelievably beautiful. So you've got a huge George and the Dragon. You've got the Virgin Mary blessing him. You've got the princess. You've got the people in the tower. But what's really cool is it's got the um, seven deadly sins and the seven acts of mercy. And the seven I've seen it. Have I've you? seen it. Oh, yes. good. Oh, good. I have. Hooray. I have. Yes. And I, I, it is better than St. Thomas's and Salisbury. Yes. Okay. It, no, you're right. Brilliant. Thank you. I mean, of course you're right. But, but no, Thanks. you're... Oh, I'm really glad. Phew. Okay, because I only have about one minute to do the last one, but just very quick. No, Rachel, you don't. Just take your time. Okay. Uh... <laughs> because this is quality. This is quality, so it's fine. All right, okay. Well, just really quickly. Okay, so this church is brilliant. I said about the St. George and the Dragon. It's also got um, a Death and the Gallant, which is u completely unique. So you've got kind of, you know, a nice, again, kind of a nice contemporary dandy fellow and then a skeleton and a shroud kind of like looking over him um seven deadly sins they are in brilliant condition and what i love about them is there's like a central beast and it's got multi heads and the heads kind of come up and in the jaws of each of the kind of sub heads um of this beast there's a little panel that contains the each um <clears throat> each of the seven deadly sins and it's just they are so <clears throat> I mean, they're just amazing. So in each one, one of my favourite ones is Gluttony, which is, um, there's a man and he's kind of got a big swollen stomach and his uh, buttons are popping off his vest and there's a, and there are kind of um, empty, empty glasses all around him. And there's a, there's a little demon who's pulling back his head and forcing more beer down his <laughs> neck, kind of forcing him <laughs> to drink more. Um, and they're just, I mean, they're just so brilliant. Um, and just just to say they were complete they were discovered completely by chance and they were getting some work done to the wall plate they were repair doing a little bit of timber repair and the builder saw a bit of red paint and said oh that might be interesting completely by chance and really yeah, some were. of the some of the best in in europe so wow. there we go dominic you should go there okay, okay last one now i'm really worried that we're going to end on a low point because i've kind of just raced through and i've kind of just kept something really quick yeah. for last but anyway uh this is literary connections so, you know, loads of literary connections. Thomas Hardy, you know, love of my life. All of that sort of stuff. Um, this one is Saint Michael and All Angels in Hather Sage, which is, um, do you know what, Tom? Making no, a noise? No? I think so. Okay, so it's, this isn't a Hardy church, but uh, it's a, basically a 14th century church. Lots of all interesting things. But the big thing here is the heirs. They're absolutely everywhere in uh, the church. They were the lords of the manor for about 800 years. So you can see them on you know, their, the font, the porch, the memorials on the walls, coats of arms. The heirs, everywhere. sorry, that's their surname. Heirs, yeah, sorry. Heirs. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, E-Y-R-E-S. Yeah. Basically, in 1854, Charlotte Bronte came here. Uh, she attended services with her friend, who was Ellen, uh, Ellen Lucy who was the sister of the newly appointed vicar and she basically Charlotte Bronte took loads from this church and her kind of time in Hathersage to write Jane Eyre which is great so um, the village of Hathersay becomes the village Morton um, Henry Newsey who's the vicar becomes St John Rivers who you know uh, saves Jane or whatever and Jane Eyre is obviously named after the heirs which is great and then very finally in the churchyard apparently is uh that is also apparently 
the resting place of um, little uh, Robin Hood's great friend, Little John. Because Little John. Little John. Very good. Oh. Because in 1784, uh, Captain James Shuttleworth discovered a, a massive femur, a massive thigh bone that was over a metre long. Oh, it um, must have been him. Must have been him. So basically, that person, the person that the bone was attached to would have been over eight feet tall. And there's only one person in all history. <laughs> Who that yep. could be? Exactly. Why, why did they think John. it was Little John? They probably just wanted like tourism or something, you know? Okay. okay. Even even in the 1784. Yeah. No, I think I, I mean I think there's a legend that his um, Little John's like hat and coat used to he used to hang his hat and coat in the church and stuff like that. Oh, I know? see. But you know, so oh, I see. he was kind of they kind of knew he was around there, so they just said. So that was your number ten, Rach. Whew. Yeah. And that and you didn't choose any churches from your native country. Well, I didn't because um, when you said it to me, first of all, <laughs> you, didn't, uh. you didn't include Ireland. And actually, you gave me the wrong date. You gave me the 13th of August for this. Um, so I had been working to a different date. So the list was kind of ready for a long time. So anyway, so I was working to that. And then, Tom, I nearly died when you said Britain and Ireland. Uh, because, oh, I saw- <laughs> So, yeah, that was panic. Well, I mean, Huge apologies to our Irish listeners and to you, Rachel, sorry. for Dominic's incompetence. What? I mean... I can choose one very quickly, but it's uh, yes. I, yeah, you're fa- yes. Let, so let's have an Irish basically, one. Basically, an Irish one. I will. It's you know, it's an, it's an obvious choice for me. But it's my local church. We grew up in Turnus Cross, which is a 1920 suburb of Cork City in Ireland. Um, the church there is amazing. Uh, it was built in uh, about 1920. Started building in about 1929, I think. Um, but it is the first concrete church in the whole of Ireland um, but also some people say it's um, the first modernist church in Ireland but it was designed by a guy called Barry Byrne who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright he was based in Chicago he never even got to see the church but it's I mean it's it's just amazing what I love about it is it kind of takes um, it draws on like Christ the Redeemer so it's a massive Christ with open arms and you kind of walk under the doors under his arms um, and it's you know limestone on the outside limestone sculpture um really interesting kind of yeah the the way the the trusses are arranged internally so it's um you know beautifully lit uh kind of a stepped gable Ugh, all this sort of stuff lovely like black marble and well, all that sort of stuff anyway well, let's, put the, let's, let's, let's put that let's put that in as 11th and you know i think we really need to find a way to put this list somewhere don't we i we mean do. i guess we, when, to, we should put images on online tom shouldn't we we'll put the and, and yes and when we publicise this on Twitter we'll we'll add so Rich if you send us the list that would be great because yeah. I mean, that's a fantastic array you've given well, us I can't yeah. thank you enough and Rach yeah. well Rach this so, is, you should plug your charity okay. so you're the director of Britain's leading churches charity <laughs> other church charities are available but they're not as good let's be honest <laughs> no, this yours, is the, yours is the Friends of Friendless Churches so tell us just a tiny bit about this extraordinary named organisation Okay, fine. Uh, so the Friends of Friendless Churches, we were founded in 1957 and it was basically, it was the 13th of July, churches were being demolished, being declared, you know, being declared redundant and just being left fall apart. And this Welshman, who was our main founder, Ivor Bulmer Thomas, gathered a group of all his friends. Um, Tom, you uh, spoke about T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was one of the founders. John Betjeman, John Piper, um, Lady Mander from Whitwick, Roy Jenkins, all of these people got together and they called themselves the Friends of Friendless Churches and they would be the group that goes out and defends these buildings um, that when they when they are no longer used for worship. And that's basically what we do. Um, you know, churches are closing. Um, more churches are probably going to close, but they are um, they are the they are some of the greatest buildings. They are the spiritual investment of generations they're like i mean they're regardless i i i think they kind of transcend time and race and religion and that they are just saturated with kind of human experience they also contain some of the best art and, art and architecture they're everywhere um and they, they should be protected for everybody and not sold off to private individuals and Fantastic. that's what we do we have we work in england and wales we're non-denominational and we have we currently have 60 churches in our care and we take on more every single year and we do it um, with a grant of £120,000. So we wow. kind of work okay. on a shoestring. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I I can't thank you enough for that. Um, and I think that your selection... Brilliant. ...eminently proves what you said about churches. 
Okay. I mean, that kind of incredible fascination. Well, I guess... Um, so thank you so much. Sorry. I guess what I want... To, sorry, Tom. I guess She's what still I, going. <laughs> well, no, I guess the reason why I kind of chose these ones is that you don't need to go to kind of... Even the smallest and most obscure church, the one on the side of a motorway, is still packed with history, even if it's, you know, Saxon, inventor of the torpedo, Von Trapps, it's all there. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rach. Thank, thank you. Thank you to everybody for listening. Visit your local church, donate to the Friends of Friendless Churches, and most of all, listen to the next Rest is History. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.